So today I'm going to um, talk about um, modern day mapping, mapping that's uh, currently uh, happening and um, a couple out, out of the hundreds of studies and mapping projects, I'm going to highlight two, um, one being aerial photography and the other being the bathymetric mapping we're doing to track the sediments down there or the, the, the effects of the dam on the sediment down there, main, primarily sand. Um, these are big projects that involve hundreds of people in the end. I am, I'm the, I guess I have the loudest mouth, so I, they put me up here to talk about these things. But these projects are, uh, are uh, cooperative efforts, and even in the modern day, we think of them as expeditions that involve a lot of people, a lot of effort, um, and I'm one of many folks um, that are involved in these. Um, I could spend the whole time uh, thanking the, and recognizing the other people involved in this project. I'll just uh, move along. Um, go back. Oop. And make a plug before I get started to the uh, Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center, the U.S. Ge Geological Survey Office that coordinates um, all the research and monitoring associated with this program. They have a really nice website. Um, they have all kinds of information available online. The, the aerial photography is available online. You can pull up pictures, current pictures from daily cameras. There's, they have a searchable library that um, has a bunch of uh, what we call gray literature, uh, Bureau of Reclamation reports, Park Service reports that aren't necessarily uh, peer-reviewed journal articles are available through their website. So I wanted to give a shout out to um, the oh, wrong way, forward. Um, you can also access all of the gauge data and plug in your own dates and look at what the flows are doing at any one time. This is uh, January of this year. Um, you can build your own chain, uh, sediment mass balance things. So there's a lot, uh, a lot of really good stuff at that web, on that website. Um, so I want to start, um, and I'm going to use this is the discharge hydrograph from the Lee's Ferry gauge. Oh, I just noticed I forgot to label the y-axis. Apologies. This is a um, Discharge hydrograph from 1920 to January of this year. This is in cubic feet per second. This is the amount of water flowing past the Lee's Ferry gauge, shown in blue. And of course, uh, it's pretty obvious where and when the dam was closed. The, the construction, the closure of the Glen Canyon Dam eliminated the spring snowmelt flood peaks that you see here to the left of the dam closure and replaced it with this this uh, vastly different flow regime that had some pretty uh, significant impacts on the downstream environment that led to the, the environmental impact statement on the effects of the dam. Oh, I keep going the wrong way. After the dam was closed from 1963 up until 1990, the, the releases from the dam were unrestricted. The, they had these daily fluctuations that were only uh, concerned with generating power. They fluctuated from very low flows, 1,000, 3,000 CFS, up to the maximum capacity of the, of the generators, to 33,000, which if you're running the river down there, that's, that, that can be up to a two to three meter tide coming in every day. Um, those fluctuations caused a lot of erosion of the beaches um, and um, led to the, the concern over all those effects led to the development of the environmental impact statement. And in 1990 um, starts an era of environmental management where if you, you can see that the the flows are, are quite, uh, the res there's restrictions on how low you can go, the ramping rate, how far you can go up and down with the river. And it's, it's within this environmental management era that um, I'm gonna highlight 
be mapping efforts for. Oh. There we go. So yeah, so zoom in, zooming in uh, on this hydrograph from 1980 to the present, um, showing a couple administrative uh, milestones. So the Glen Canyon Dam environmental impact statement started in 1990, 1992, the Grand Canyon Protection Act was passed. The record of decision took six years to make a decision on the, the thing. It was the longest, most expensive environmental impact statement um, in, the, in, the, in the country up to that date. Um, and then um, in, in 2012, we started this uh, HFE protocol. HFE stands for high flow events or controlled floods. Call it what you want. Those are dam releases above power plant capacity. And the, the intent with these is to, is to bring the dam up into a, as big of a flood as you can get in the post-dam era, redistribute the sediment, rebuild the eroded sandbars, and also to introduce, reintroduce an element of disturbance to the system that um, and so starting in 2012, um, we, we, in 1996 was the first controlled flood, or HFE, and there were three of them done, and there was quite an administrative battle to get those, um, those floods, because they have to bypass the power plant. So they're, in a lot of people's mind, they're wasting um, money by bypassing the power plant. Anyways, in 2012, we've started this protocol where the floods are triggered by sediment inputs from the tributaries. So it's, um, it's not quite as much of a struggle anymore. But these, uh, this, the high flow protocol led to, or the development of the high pro flow protocol led to the development of the channel mapping program that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit here. Um, keep going the wrong way. So here's the mapping efforts, uh, timeline of the mapping efforts I'm going to talk about today. First, the aerial photography, canyon-wide aerial photographs were collected in 2002, 2009, and 2013. And in 2009, we started this channel mapping effort um, and continue that to this day. We still got some work left to do. Um, of course, all of the survey effort, efforts down there, we've heard um, about the benchmarks being developed by the, the Mathis surveys and Washburn out on his points, helicopter to his points. It was good times for surveyors when you could get a helicopter ride. Um, all, so all of the studies down there um, are based on this control network of benchmarks. Um, they provide a common data for all the monitoring projects down there. There's over 1,500 benchmarks along the river corridor. There's a bunch of them scattered about the region up on the rims. They all have uh, GNSS, which is the new term for GPS. It's G GPS is the US satellite constellation. There's a GLONASS constellation. There's Eurosat, referred to as GNSS now. Um, to, and total station measurements. They're adjusted in a least squares adjustment framework to provide subs mostly sub-centimeter accuracy on each one of those points down there. That some of them, well, we don't need to go into that. Um, so we use the Arizona State Plain Central Zone in meters uh, with uh, NAD83 ellipsoid heights as our projection. So everything out of the program comes in this, in this, uh, this geodetic geodetic parameters. We do run into some issues. Well, I don't have time to go into it. I want to want to get on to the actual mapping project, but um, we would really like to form our own projection in the canyon um, with a central meridian, something like this, so we can get away from the um, distortion of things out to the side of the projection. I had to throw that in for the survey bros over there. <laughs> um, so here's a, here's a map of uh, those control points again, different projection. If we zoom in on the Point Hansboro region, you can see these points down along the river. They're everywhere down there. Um, and uh, this box here is where we're going to go to next. I have a lot of examples today from the Eminence area. It's one of my favorite places in the world. 
Um, and so when I get to make example maps, I usually make them of that area. So here's, uh, this is the 2009 digital photograph. Um, and it's showing the control points down, down the, along the river. And you can see that you can, you go down there to survey, you've got a lot of options for uh, benchmarks in this particular place, which is kind of nice. They're not, not, not as uh, numerous everywhere, but down here there's, in this area, there's quite a few of them. These benchmarks along the river are typically um, scribed Xs. There's uh, a lot of the old survey marks are these rusty nails or um, bolts. The newer marks are these brass pins that we set in into holes. Uh, there's, there's occasional caps you can find. And up on the rim, uh, the monuments are a little easier to find. Sometimes looking for these scribed decks on a rock can be uh, quite a challenge. Um, and to do the surveying down there, we use these benchmarks. We set up all our instruments on these benchmarks and utilize them to provide a common reference frame for all the mapping. So of course, some benchmarks are better than others. And sometimes with this data that's line of, it's line of sight data, you gotta put the gun where you, can, where you need to see and you get stuck on a rock in the middle of the river. There are worse fates. Um, so onto the aerial photography. Um, so again, uh, missions that were flown in 2002, 2009, 2013, using these fancy German push broom sensors, collected digital four band, red, green, blue, and near infrared data. The product is, is uh, it's a digital ortho photograph using this tiling scheme, uh, quarter quads tiling scheme that you can just pull in to a, a GIS or whatever, whatever system you want and make your own river maps if you'd like. They're uh, 20 centimeter ground resolution and they also come with a, a digital surface model product that's photogrammetrically derived from the, uh, from the air photos with a one meter cell resolution. This, these photographs are just primarily of the river corridor, about a half a kilometer or so wide part of the river corridor. Um, here's the flight, flight path. Zoom in on the Little Colorado confluence. Um, each segment is flown with five to six parallel linear flight lines that overlap. So there's quite a bit of flying happening out there. Um, this is a discharge hydrograph to show that the, the photographs are collected at a constant flow release from the dam of 8,000 CFS. There's three lines. The Lee's Ferry gauge is in the dark line here. These are Grand Canyon and uh, the Diamond Creek gauge. So the flight window starts when the flow gets down to 8,000, so you have a consistent level of the water in the photographs, or as much as we can control that. Um, during the missions, we, uh, use, um, we have a lot of ground support operations. Each one of these bench, benchmarks on the rim, we have two benchmarks, at least two, usually three to four stations within 30 kilometers of the collection area with a GPS, GNSS base station collecting one second data. There's a helicopter flying out here to, we download those receivers, helicopter grabs that data and grabs the data from the airplane processes that night, if there's any issues, then we go and refly that data just to ensure the, uh, the quality of this data collection. We also put over 100, and over 100 panels are down there on benchmarks along the river. We put these one meter square panels in there to um, help with the, with the rectification of the photos and provide horizontal and vertical um, ground control. Um, if we go back to the eminence area and zoom in on this red box, you can see one of those photo panels in the 2009 photos right up there. There's the photo panel on a point. Um, in addition to the photo panels, we also collect topographic data down there to check the rectifications that are done. So we have thousands of points down along the river that we use to check the vendor and provide control on, our, um, on the digital surface model. Here's an example of that one meter cell digital surface model um, showing 
That's not, that's is actually a rock fall, not a debris fall. This is that one that's right up above, uh, between Buck Farm and uh, 43 Mile, if you're familiar with the place. Um, photo in 2000, or digital surface model in 2009 and in 2003. You can actually see up here where there's a little piece in the shadow here that peeled off and went all the way down into the river. So, yeah, so here's the, this little chunk up here fell off into the river. So that's an example of the uh, real nice resolution on that. And these, these photos are being used, like Carl said, Carl Stum said the other day, these, uh, the topography that's collected down there starts this process of, um, the, the ideas explode around this topography. And these, in the, the same is true for the photography. So um, we use these, a number of studies use them. This is an example of campsite mapping used. There's the near infrared for the, um, for the vegetation. A lot of vegetation surveys um, use this aerial photography to map out the plant species down there in different zones around the river. This is a real neat one uh, by Bedford et al. recently that looks at the um, tamarisk beetle impact. And they use this automated classification scheme to come up with percentage of beetle impacted areas for the whole canyon. Um, so that's it for the, for the aerial photography. I'm going to move now on to this channel mapping project we use. This is a digital elevation model, a quarter meter uh, resolution elevation model <coughs> of a piece of the channel down there. This is about 300 meters long. Um, the purpose of this mapping is to monitor the sediment um, and construct these morphologic-based sediment budgets. Along with that is a basic topographic mapping of a blank area on the map in, in Grand Canyon. So to this day, there's blank areas on the map that we're still filling in. We're, we're still standing on the shoulders of those giants that we've heard about all day, or all uh, the last couple days. Um, we've got, this is a map showing the amount We've mapped from the Glen Canyon Dam down to Phantom Ranch and from National Canyon down to Diamond Creek. It's about 160 miles of channel we have mapped. We've got about 70 miles to go to complete a map of the Grand Canyon, of the Colorado River and the canyon. Um, the way we construct these maps is we combine, on the right side you'll see the different data collect, three different types of data we've collected. Um, to produce these one meter grid cell evolution resolution maps of the channel. Um, we start by doing total station surveys um, above the water and in places, shallow areas where the boats can't get. Those are shown in red on the upper map here. There's a spread of points again in the eminence area. Um, and we combine those with sonar surveys, sound and navigation ranging. Um, and we have two different types of sonar down there. We use single beam shown in yellow on the upper map and multi-beam surveying, uh, which comprises about 85% of the area of these surveys, which is a, um, a it, it's swath surveying. It, it puts out a 140 degree swath under the boat and you drive up and down the channel to map it. We've got these special purpose-built boats that um, have to navigate the rapids and keep all the electronics safe. Um, great to see Mark Gonzalez here. We started working and he started developing these boats back in the early 2000s and we've uh, continued his legacy and kept up with the technology. This is an example of, of doing a survey. Here's the, the survey consoles, two screen. You have the sonar wedge on this side, navigation screen. And here's an example. This is during a survey. It's about four meters deep. And here's the boat. And the white area is the area that's unmapped. And we are literally filling in those blank areas. It's like driving a Zamboni or driving. <laughs> you drive, you mow the, you're out there mowing the grass. And you better not leave any strips <laughs> in between. And it's, it's, it's an amazing job. We're very lucky to do it. Here's an example from, I'm glad you showed that, uh, Cave Springs 
um, the bird's eye expedition, having a bad day right at the top of Cave Springs here. This is, uh, this is the, these are the track lines of the boat used to collect the, the topography in this pool. Um, pretty cool pool down below Cave Spring. There's a big red wall ledge there. This is one of the deeper holes, about 24 meters deep there. Um, of course, we use these to, um, to map changes in sediment and produce uh, change maps and look at uh, the dynamics of how the sediment's moving around down here. Um, again, the eminence pool, this is the survey in 2009. This is 2012. You just simply subtract those two digital elevation models and you can come up with these change maps that show you where the sand is being eroded, where it's being deposited, and you scale these surveys up to 30 mile stretches. Here's that eminence pool here. Um, and come up with these uh, assessments of the sediment. So again, we've, we've got 160 miles mapped. Uh, in 2009 and 2012, we repeated uh, this section in Lower Marble Canyon. Um, in 2011 and 2014, we repeated the uh, section from the Little Colorado River down to Phantom Ranch. We did a really fun survey up in Glen Canyon, the 15 miles from the dam down to Lee's Ferry, on the controlled flood in 2014, because it's very shallow up there. So they, when they released that high flow, we jumped on the opportunity to get a little depth under our transducers. 2013, 2016, we repeated Lee's Ferry to uh, the 30-mile gauge. And in 2017, we went from National down to Diamond Creek. Um, this is a slide that answers the age-old question, how deep is the river? This is the over eight and a half million cells of the one meter digital elevation models, the depth of the river at 8,000, um, the, the red line is a normalized, a normal population. So um, somebody asked you how deep the river is and you say uh, about five meters, five, six meters. Um, so we could do things like like this to characterize the channel, what the, what the depths are of the channel. We can look at how the channel, this is a graph showing the large scale control of the river level geology. Blue is the average river depth per mile. Green is the river width. And sure enough, when the river's wider, it's shallower. When the river's narrower, <laughs> we've, we've, we've can statistically prove what we already know, <laughs> that the channel is deeper towards the middle and it's shallower towards either side. <laughs> it took us a, lo a long time to get there. Um, I'll just keep going here. And we can answer all kinds of questions about the uh, movement of the sediment and the effects of the dam on the sediment. I'm not going to go through these. These are examples of what we can do with the data. Um, Another data set that we uh, collect along with the depths is called backscatter. Um, and this is, so this is what the, the multi-beam receiver is listening to. It's like it makes a ping. It's listening, it's listening, ping. That's the bottom. You can take the backscatter is the analysis of this return signal, the, the amplitude and the shape of that. Um, and here's a map of it on a perspective view. The, the substrate that the, the sound bounces off of has a different shape depending on whether it's mud, whether it's sand, whether it's rock. So you can analyze that return signal or the backscatter and come up with maps of what the substrate type is. So for all the mapping down there, we have the topography and we, we have um, a map of what the substrate is based on that um, backscatter signal. Um, we've done this also, this is an example from Glen Canyon where it's very vegetated. These are um, camera locations that we've taken observations of. We've done the, veg the classification from the backscatter and the uh, match of the actual ground truth to this um, backscatter mapping is about 85 to 90 percent. So it's, it's pretty uh, amazing. My colleague Dan Buscombe is really good at 
processing signals. Um, another real fun study we did uh, was down at Diamond Creek. We, we did some repeat mapping of this section to look at um, how much sediment is transported along the bed of the river, not just in the water column. So we repeated these surveys and we've made a, a video of this. Each frame of this video is a pass of the multi-beam. Oh. I actually work for a Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center right out of school. So I took the cable car across at Vietnam and Diamond Creek many, many times, um, collecting suspended sediment and bed material samples. But I have two simple questions. Where does the funding come from? And what's the end goal? <laughs> uh, you have two questions. One's easy to answer. One's <laughs> a little trickier. The, this program is funded. Uh, it's called the Glen Canyon Dam Envir uh, Adaptive Management Program. Our, the funds come from well, they just changed last year. You might have heard in, the, in October there was some, uh, the current administration uh, w did not allow power revenues from the dam to be transferred to the Bureau for their environmental programs. Um, so previous to this year, the, the money came from power revenues at the dam. Um, when this uh, kerfuffle came along, the funding now comes from appropriated funds. Senator, uh, there's a couple senators that attached a rider to a bill to um, uh, provide the funding to the Bureau of Reclamation for, um, there's two or three upper Colorado River Basin endangered species recovery programs, the Glen Canyon Dam, the Grand Canyon program, and um, there's a couple other projects in there. It's $23 million a year. The Glen Canyon Dam Environmental Studies is a uh, $11 million a year program. Uh, and the Grand Canyon Protection Act as well. So yeah, the, and um, there's a lot of fisheries work going on down there that um, uh, endangered species work. The Grand Canyon Protection Act is uh, uh, a much broader piece of legislation specifically for Grand Canyon that says they have to operate the dam with the downstream environment in mind. So there's uh, sediment studies, there's uh, studies of uh, impacts to cultural um, programs, uh, native fish, uh, a lot of different studies going on down there. With the end goal of trying to um, manage the dam to mitigate and the effects of the dam on the downstream environment. Okay, uh, just you raised my curiosity when you started talking about sonar. In 1959, there was a couple boats uh, sunk intentionally at Pipes Creek. Then there was a plane crash upriver that augured in. Do you find things other than sediment? No. <laughs> Is this short? Well, um, we haven't found any planes. We haven't found any, uh, we have found um, some tires right downstream from Lee's Ferry. We also found, I think we did that survey, we saw a motor on the bed of the river. Uh, the revolution, the resolution of the, of the sonar is good enough to find it, but I don't think that stuff stays, stays around for, for very long. Well, these were fiberglass boats and the plane was metal. I was just curious because- Yeah, it, no, we haven't seen any of that. We, we don't survey in the rapids also is another point. We, those, sensors that are in the water are pretty expensive so we pick them up out of the water well just we a heads around. up if you happen to notice these anomalies will probably excite you okay yeah. <laughs> thanks we'll look for them okay we've got time we, for one more question oh one more question okay yeah it sounds like this is classic mapping at its finest uh, can you give us an insight uh, going forward with some of the uh, like planet labs uh, say the landsat uh, satellites, the European satellites, the role maybe that uh, drones will play with regard to, uh, you know, high resolution uh, LIDAR and so forth. I mean, how will that technology impact our knowledge to expand on what you've done? Well, the, um, we've tried to get some drone flights down there. Um, uh, 
drone fights are not allowed in um, the national park at this moment, but um, certainly we're looking to apply that technology um, to the canyon environment. Um, we're getting to a point where that you have to ask yourself how how much do you how how far do you want to zoom into that topography? Like we could do lidar overflights. You can do um, structure from motion. Uh, extraction of topography from overlapping aerial photos from drones you could map things to you could get like one centimeter contour lines on some of these places that they, yeah, the question is why why would you want to know that um, uh, but certainly we're looking at applying uh, these new techno I'm not sure about any of the Landsat um, aerial photography uh, or the yeah the satellite based photo missions I know they're out there um, but we haven't used them. I think we're, we're gonna schedule another overflight of the river corridor here in the next couple years that we can use to further our understanding of and monitoring of the changes down there, especially in the vegetation. No, we're skipping the video. I'm skipping the video because I think that's what crashed it, but I had some slides after that that I want to share with you. Just like five minutes, maybe less. You guys cool with that? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Matt and Nick and Matt, the real, the real driver behind things here. Yeah, I keep going for indulging me. But I have, uh, I ended the slide with sort of a tour of some images of the surveys from the dam downstream. There's, I think, five or six of them that I wanted to share with you. Because these, these are areas that have never been mapped until now. And um, it's a Grand Canyon mapping conference, and I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, right there. Oh, that one? Yep. So obviously starting at the dam, um, that's what the bed of the river looks like right under the dam. And I got to tell you, it was an amazing experience coming up right next to the dam. I, I had a sticker in my hand ready, but we, we never got that close. But it, was, it, it is a weird sensation right there. Things are humming and moving. Um, anyways, that's the, uh, mo all of these are uh, digital elevation models. With, I have a bunch of different shading techniques, but I think you get the gist that, uh, you know, that's deep, that's shallow. Um, this is, I'm glad uh, Robert showed the picture of the bridge. Um, this is the Marble Canyon Bridge. This is the old bridge. Here's the new one. Um, I overlaid the topography. This is typically rapids in the Grand Canyon. All of them are formed at tributary side canyons, where the side canyons, debris flows, um, deliver a bunch of coarse grain sediment to it, um, uh, to the river that pinches the river and forms rapids and riffles. This is the only man-made riffle or debris flow in Grand Canyon right under the bridge. Um, probably partially due to construction of the bridge and partially due to um, the sport of <laughs> post-dam construction going out. <laughs> Anyways, um, we don't know why it's there, but it's definitely man-made. Um, and there's a deep, deep pool below the other bridge. This is, uh, these are, this is a 25 centimeter uh, resolution digital elevation model of right above uh, Badger Rapid is right here. And these are these um, beautiful dune field above Badger Rapid. Um, uh, this is uh, the Saddle Canyon camps, the main saddle camp is here. There's an eddy here. You can see the amazing uh, dune structure within eddies and the dunes in the downstream in the runout uh, as you go past the sandbar. Um, this is an example of a 60 mile um, of the changes that can occur, the beautiful changes. These are uh, Tapete's ledges here. Um, and this was a 2013, 2014 survey. Um, there, there are, uh, there's up to about three or four meters of change in the eddy over here, um, over that year time. Um, this is, uh, here's Phantom Ranch, here's the South Kaibab Trail coming in, overlaid on the South Kaibab Bridge, the boat beach. Um, this is the lower cremation camp, if you're familiar with it. This is the deepest point that we've surveyed so far. It's uh, 26 meters deep at uh, 8,000 cubic feet per second. So um, 
with that 70 miles that we have left, I'm sure there's uh, some pools that are uh, of this magnitude, but um, if the, so the, the deepest, the, how deep is the river? It's, it averages about five to six meters deep. The deepest hole is about 26, about 100 feet deep. Um, can't wait to get down there and get the rest of them surveyed so we have a full um, mix of it. Um, this is a, I really love this, this one. I put it in because it shows the, these are ledges of Bright Angel sandstone. This is uh, at mile 171. This is the Stairway Canyon debris fan, and this is uh, Mohawk Canyon down here. Um, just some beautiful structure in the, in the dunes and uh, resolution on the, the ledges. And finally, I believe this is the final one. This is, uh, this is the, the map right there showing this almost perfectly circular bow shock around Vulcan's anvil. That's the Vulcan anvil right there. And uh, there's just this big circle around it. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and so th that's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks for indulging me, Nick and Matt, and Matt for bringing this back up. Thanks, you guys. Have a great lunch.